Okay. Well, Kimberly, great to see you or not see, I see you. <laughs> um, and I'm so happy that we get to do this again. And it's, um, and connect again is really important, uh, at least for, for me to see you again. So, you know, I know a bit about you, not only what you're doing um, at uh, General Mills, but I also know about your career path. And I think it really does lead to you being a multicultural expert. So I would love for you to share with everyone, um, not only what you're doing at General Mills, but also your background and, and what you've been doing to get to the point that, that you're at right now, I think is, is really interesting and does give you that multicultural expertise label. Thank you, my friend. Um, so for yes, so everyone, I, my name is Kimberly MacArthur, or I actually go by Kimberley. Um, so I grew up in Latin America. I was born and raised there, um, moved to the US when I was about 14 years old, um, but definitely grew up as Kimberley MacArthur. Um, and so I moved to the US and I had a very kind teacher try to recoach my name in English. Um, but I've been working in multicul multicultural marketing for about 19 years now. And um, what I think has been really interesting is just seeing the trajectory of the industry, seeing the changes in the conversation. Um, I also call it a little bit of the cha-cha, seeing where we've taken one step forward and two step back, um, you know, as we kind of go through this process of, of bringing brands back into conversation and into relationship with diverse consumers. And so my background, as BJ mentioned, is very diverse, actually. I've worked at Univision and Telefutura in Chicago. I used to work in sales for an Indian BPO. Um, I, I call it my MBA, but I got my MBA at Edelman PR. Um, it, it was an incredible training ground. I was part of the multicultural team there. That was just um, probably some of the 10 best years of my life, um, really just doing everything when it came to diversity marketing, which, which was what we called it back then. Um, and then I moved into, from PR, I moved into advertising. Advertising moved into digital. Um, digital started doing production. And so I've been really blessed to be able to have touched a lot of different facets of marketing. I've even done shopper marketing. And now I'm on the client side um, at General Mills where really my, my, I call it my personal challenge, my personal goal, and the whole reason for my being here at Mills is to really help us to, again, create those authentic relationships with our consumers that are of a different background, specifically Hispanic or multicultural, knowing that multicultural as a segment is kind of like an everything and nothing, um, but really focusing on being in authentic relationship with our consumers and, and making sure that not only are we providing the products that our, our consumers want in a diverse America, but we're also creating true conversations um, to be able to engage people where they are versus you know, transactionally exclusively. Um, so that is kind of the gist of, of my, my realm. I do consider myself a multicultural champion. I think, um, you know, I've been doing this because I love it. I love this work. I think you have to be always curious to be a multicultural marketer because you're learning something new every single day. And I just consider myself incredibly honored to be a champion for our communities. And you do a great job of it. Um, one of the things that we've discussed, you and I, not in the past and um, more recently when we were doing our prep on this, is that, you know, in general, what we've seen over the years, which has driven me insane, and I'm sure you as well, but we see a mentality of check the box and we're doing our multicultural best if we are, you know, for example, advertising during his Black Heritage Month, uh, Pride Month, or Hispanic Heritage Month. And there's a lot of brands that just jump in on those particular months and um, they consider that multicultural marketing. So how can we ensure that we build an authentic connection um, and extend past this whole dedicated month theory? That is such an interesting question. And um, I pause because I will say, I think, especially this year, um, I have seen, I mean, you, you think about the work that Target's done, the work that Walmart's done in terms of just even showing up for Latino-owned businesses during Hispanic Heritage Month. I think my, my challenge is I celebrate the fact that we are honoring specific groups. Um, I, I wish it was a little bit more uh, year round. Um, there's also finite resources from a marketing and just even a mental real estate and communication real estate perspective. So I do understand that there are specific places and times but I think my challenge would be, and this is something that we talk a lot about within my teams. Um, if you are for families today, you are for Latino families because that is where the population growth is coming. And so that is not necessarily something you exclusively do between the months of September and October. Um, if you are trying to create, again, you'll, you, you'll hear me use the word relationship because I truly believe 
that this is not just a marketing comms one way. This is very much about creating an authentic relationship. So we kind of have to like date, you know, courtship, um, make sure that there's mutual benefit, and then get into a true and real relationship in marriage. Um, and that takes time. And it definitely is not something that you can accomplish in just one month. I do think celebratory months are important to help to recognize and push forward additional stories that really need to be coming to the forefront. I mean, I think when you think about American culture today, I know when I moved here when I was 14 and I moved here from Mexico City, it was like baseball, Saved by the Bell, 90210, and like, <laughs> you know, apple pie. That's what American yeah. culture was. But if you right. think about that under 18 population who is now, you know, they're diversity natives, it's a multicultural majority, their America and their American culture is very different because ethnic cultures have affected and influenced so much of mainstream culture in this country that it is a different conversation. And so it is no longer fit exclusively into celebratory months. And so right. I do think that they're an important platform. I do, however, challenge everyone on the call and all of the brands to be able to say, if you have identified a specific target group or specific culture that you really think that you have a great affinity and you can in respect to that culture and to that consumer, you can show up in that cultural expression, then do it year round for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially since, you know, as they spoke of before um, in an earlier um, fireside chat, the importance of looking at the growth of the Hispanic population and, and the age and the yep. age. So it's, it just behooves me sometimes, and I don't know what you think about this, but when you see the obvious of the growth of not only Gen Z, but um, millennial, and if you're not branding them now, um, where are you where are you as a brand going to be in you know 10 20 years as far as an awareness i mean, I mean that's an important of... point bj because the whole conversation as business people is how are you future proofing your business you right. know the census numbers told us that the conversation now is about multifaceted identities the mixed race population those people who self identify as mixed race who are able to actively do so on the census that exploded that was like what was 300 something percent um that is a huge impact and something that we as multicultural marketers should be, and even not even multicultural marketers, we as marketers should be paying attention to because consumers are, are essentially telling us that they identify with different elements and aspects of their identity. And mm -hmm. so our opportunity as marketers is to be able to say, you don't have to be Latino to participate in Latinidad. I mean, mm -hmm. Spanish language music is the number one genre in this country. Bad Bunny, everybody knows Bad Bunny. <laughs> you may not understand what he's saying, but you may be buying his music, you may be buying into his brand. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is a point of influence. And so I think like what I would, I would push back to say is that we have to change the way we did things. You know, back in the early days when it was like salsa, out sells ketchup and BJ, you know, remember those days, right? That was like our big data point online. Um, right. Oh my God, the 2000s. Um, but now it's like, we have so much data, we have so much insights and it's almost to the point where you're just like, but what do you do with it? And I do think that it's almost like two sides of a coin. You cannot exclusively look at data without having a cultural filter against it to be able to say, where do I actually have the right to play? And then it's not just about, you know, ethnicity and race. It's about mm -hmm. cultural participation. And I think that's what's going to change the industry when we start to think about the fact that like K-pop to me is a great example of the fact that it's not just a Korean audience. It is a massive global audience. It is a movement. I mean, they've done duets with like Rake and like, I think they even did one with Romeo Santos. And so they're getting into reggaeton. So what does that mean? It's just, it's mm. this amalgamation of culture, which I just think is really delicious and rich. And it's one of the things that I think makes me most excited about being a marketer today. Yeah. And speaking of culture, one of the things, and I thought this was great that you brought this up yesterday um, when we were talking, but about culture and language and where do you see Spanish? I mean, so, you know, everyone tends to put everybody in a box. You're this acculturation, you must be bilingual. You're this acculturation, you must be Spandam, you know? So we were talking yesterday about kind of where Spanish fits into the life of the US Hispanic market, no matter what acculturation level, if you will, you're at. So it's interesting because after our conversation, I really sat down and thought about this. And the reality is, is language is organic and constantly evolving. Um, I think the best example of that from a content or consumer media standpoint is Hentified. And I've done this as an assignment within my teams internally to be able to say, watch Hentified with a filter of how language dynamics are happening 
within the community between you know father to son and so there's a scene where it's like the father is speaking in spanish the, the, the son is answering in him in english and then there's also you know other dynamics of like different latin american backgrounds so whether they're from mexico from argentina or from venezuela um one of the things that i love about the american latino experience is that um and i think there's like that don omar anthem song the latino song which that like still makes my heart happy we have come together with mm -hmm. our differences and we have found a unity in our passion points. And I think Spanish to me is an incredible tool to be able right. to bring that together. There's that whole phrase about like English, we is our, is our language of business and Spanish uh -huh. language is the language of our hearts. And we have so much data from our media partners that show the amount of receptivity from a Spanish language ad like delivers higher ROI than, a, than an English language ad. And it might be the similar or same content. Um, I do think that there's something interesting that's happening, right? Like language is an, is an evolution. And so we even talk with our brands about like English leading Spanglish or Spanish leading Spanglish. Um, how are we showing up based on our demographic? Because if you're going after tween target, they're you know generally English dominant, but they're throwing in Spanish. And then there's the deliciousness of retro acculturation where you've just got a, num a great amount of uh, community. And there's actually a, um, a, there's a, oh my gosh, there's a profile on Instagram that I follow because it's such an interesting conversation and it's called Spanish Sin Pena. And it's all of these second, third, fourth generation Latinos in the States who did not grow up speaking Spanish. And there's the whole thing about like, well, if you don't speak Spanish, are you, la are you really Latino? And that is such an unfair, I think, black and white perspective of what being Latino means in this country. But there mm -hmm. is again, that movement to bring in more Spanish because it is the language of our ancestors. It is a language of our cultures of origin. Um, and it, it, again, I think it, there's things that you can say in Spanish that there's no equivalent in English. And so I think right. as a friend, um, you just have to figure out what you're trying to do. If you're trying to create that emotional response, if you're trying to truly be in relationship, um, how is language as a tool helping you to do that? Right. And so do you think that plays into creative as well? Um, you know, in other words, you see so many people who are just trying to take even in television commercials, they, they take their English. I'll, I'll see an English, you know, I don't know, NBC, ESPN, whatever. Um, I'll see a, an English commercial and then I'll see it again in the Spanish. And it's like, I don't see the difference. I, how, how can brands develop kind of a stronger cultural relevance, you know, within within um, trying to create a difference in their own ads, if you will. So I, I guess I would caution against not doing difference for different sake. I do think that there is a place that if you have a Latino target and you've made, you've essentially built a Latino insight that is your creative territory and space and it's, it's driving your creative strategy, um, you can do an English and Spanish language spot that is deeply Latino. So uh, that is still possible. So I, I do want to say that it's not just about language. It's about that is, is exactly what you mentioned, right? There's the cultural relevance and the cultural resonance and the cultural cues that show up in that spot um, that are incredibly important, that are even more important than just language alone. Because to your point, BJ, consumers, I mean, the focus groups that we've been having Consumers are wicked smart. I mean, they are seen through all of our stuff, my friends. Like we need to up our game because honestly consumers, they're, they're essentially doing reverse briefs in their brains. Um, and I have been just incredibly fascinated by what I'm hearing and then it's across generations. Hey, wait a second, reverse briefs in their brains? Yeah, so they're looking at our okay. TV spot and they're saying, that's not for me. They just put that in Spanish language, but this isn't about my family. This isn't about me. They're not in relationship to me. And so consumers, you know, they're calling BS on our work right now. They're really saying like, either I'm resonating with that or I'm not. And so right. I think it's on us as brand marketers to make sure that we are taking the extra step to, to ensure that it's not just a language translation, it's a cultural, you know, relevancy. It's a cultural connection mm -hmm. that we are delivering forward in our creative. And again, my whole point is you can do it in English, Spanish, you know, Spanglish, whatever way you lean, but if it's not culturally relevant, it's not going to be worth it for anything. And this isn't just about Latinidad. This is about culture across the board, across all other ethnicities and races. If you are not speaking within their cultural norms, if you are not fluent in their culture, they're going to call you on it for sure. I'm sure they are. So to that very topic, have you seen any um, in particular creatives or, or commercials? Um, it doesn't have to be General Mills, obviously. It can be, it can be anybody. Some, 
some company that has actually done a great job of, of doing this and making it work. I mean, I have, I think, um, so it's interesting because I think there's something to be said about my personal bias, right? There's, there's certain ads. Um, I will tell you, I think it was a 2019 ARP um, caregiver hero spot where, um, you know, to set the stage, it's the, it's the initial vid video is, um, you know, a dad picking up a little girl and she's got this red cape. I think it's like a, like a napkin or, or paper, not a napkin, like a tablecloth or something. So it's like right. a red cape. Um, and he's picking her up and he's, it's just, um, there's just incredible dynamic between father and child. And then they fast forward to when the father is already in his, you know, late seventies, let's just call it um, like later life stage. And the, the daughter is about my age in her forties. And there's this dynamic about the fact that you need to really connect um, and take care of your parents. Well, the one thing I will tell you is I watched that spot and I was weeping. And I was just, I considered AARP in a way that I'd never seen it before. And not because my father and I had that kind of dynamic, but there was an emotional truth in the storytelling that was just so incredibly powerful that um, honestly, it, I still think about this ad and it's like 2019. There's another movement from Modelo. So Modelo did a, a multi-year campaign and I'm a big fan of multi-year campaigns, my friends, because there is something about consistency. But um, Modelo did a fighting spirit campaign. And I really love that one because what it did is it, um, you know, we have a lot, especially over the last year, a lot of brands have been taking stands and making comments and making commitments on social and equity issues that may not necessarily always be in line with like who they are in their brand. But like I said, Modelo had this multi-year campaign and they really started in this year, I think they were featuring a lot of small businesses. And there was something really beautiful about the storytelling, about the fact that honestly, when you think about Modelo, it's really about coming together. It's about mm -hmm. um, the enjoyment and that moment. And I think that they captured the spirit of the brand, the, the consumption of the brand, the energy, the emotion that the consumption can bring, not from like, a, I'm just drinking a beer, but like right. Modelo brings me closer to my roots. Modelo brings me closer to my people. And I can celebrate um, our, our greatness. I can celebrate the, the wins of my community um, with this brand. And I just, it just, it was incredible because to me also, a, it has to be an effective campaign, right? Like you can do great TV um, or great video and that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't drive down a conversion, if you're not connecting down to shopper marketing, you're not connecting down to on-premise, then it's really going to have a disconnect. And I think that was to me a best in class example of something that connected from a holistic 360 perspective that really right. again brought the character of the brand. It it raised up the the character of the consumer and it brought real mm -hmm. connectivity in a in a current and modern way. Yeah. And the music in that ad also was like oh. spot on. Yeah, it really put everything together. And speaking um, about music, there's an Advis spot from 2018 that I still like use in presentations internally. Um, uh, it's the, I'm trying to remember the name of the spot, but I think it was like fervor, but it's all about like what being Mexican means. And it shows uh -huh. you like someone who's like dressed as an Azteca. And then it shows you someone who's uh -huh. like a big like, bohemian and someone who's a hipster. And it's all true. We are all of those things, not as one individual being all the things, but our community is is so incredibly diverse and today we're still having the conversations about the diversity and the fact that we're not all the same. Um, right. That is something that I crave will change soon as more of our Latino stories show up. Um, my hope is non-Latinos can really see us for the incredible rich tapestry that we are as a community. Yeah, and, and to that point, it's like, okay, so what, what do you see that's happening? Are there any shifts going on in the multicultural marketer today? Are there any like futuristic um, wants or needs that you would love to have, um, you know, not, not only just today, this year and next year, but beyond? Um, I think shifts, I think the conversation of multicultural marketing has never been so in, in like the media and current, um, you know, non-marketers are talking about diversity and inclusion. They're talking about representation. We're seeing representation conversations across all different kinds of media, across different, like what brand's role is in there. I think that's something that's really spectacular. I do think that as a marketplace, we're often very reactionary. I remember hearing, it was like an NPR interview like two years ago where like CPGs can only focus on one segment at a time. And so um, I think the challenge for us as brands is we cannot be all things to all people. However, I do think we can challenge ourselves by really identifying who our consumer target is, who are essentially our, our muse is, 
um, and being being honestly authentic and honoring that muse. Um, because then we can tell better stories that again, you can tell a phenomenal Latino story about a father and, and daughter relationship that can definitely echo beyond, you know, someone who's Latino. Um, because there's there's these authentic human truths that are, are true and shared. Um, I think what makes me excited about what's happening and changing is what I mentioned earlier, which is the aspects of identity. I think that conversation versus, you know, 10 years ago when it was just like, we're marketing to first generation Hispanics or we're marketing to, you know, a quote unquote urban, um, you know, uh, consumer who's a millennial, we're, mm -hmm. we're able to now get so much smarter about psychographics and behaviors and participation, as I mentioned, in culture. And so that I think we have tools as marketers to be able to tell a better story about our consumer to really see our consumers for who they want to be seen as an interesting sentence structure there. Um, and I think, um, I think this is the time for us to listen, you know, listen differently right. than we have before. Um, throw away decks that are three years old. I think data that's over six months old, like got to toss it out, get new data. Um, yeah. Kind of weirdly, you know, intense about that. It's just like, once it's one years old, it's, it's, it's old now. Like, what does it mean to live in a polycultural, multicultural, microcultural society? I don't have right. the answer, but I have the questions, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. We did get a question about the Modelo campaign, and so I'm going to read it to you now since um, it's kind of on topic. Um, this is from Juan. Thanks for sharing your perspective on Modelo's campaign and your thoughts around con continuity. I assume that Modelo's critical mass most probably allows for this. What are your thoughts for smaller brands around being able to generate awareness and trial? Thank you for the question. Um, I think you still have an opportunity. I mean, I love the idea of re-energizing older brands and treating them like they're a launch brand. Um, for smaller brands, I think you've just got to identify who your niche hero is. And when you do that, just be true to that niche hero. And so I'm not really sure from like the question asked if there's a specific category or industry that you're a part of, but when you think about what you're trying to do, I think if I could give you you know, some, some key things to think about is definitely like, who's your, who's your muse? Who's your hero? Um, you know, who are some of your mentor brands that you can take a look at and, and identify what maybe steps they've taken that you could emulate and identify. Um, I also think that today is very different from 15 years ago because a smaller brand has a completely different platform. You don't have to buy on Univision, Telemundo and NBC and ABC. You right. can get a phenomenal content influencer and you can do stuff on YouTube. You can do stuff, you know, on social media. I think um, there is more power for smaller brands today than I think there was before. And yep. I think it's also with the right partners, you can identify what your niche areas are and then really take that over. I think the biggest thing is to identify the fact that, you know, you're growing. So you're not trying to reach all the people all the time, but make sure that you get some real brand love. I think the, the greatest example of that was the, the resurrection of PBR. So if you haven't seen that case study, I'm not gonna go through it now, but I highly recommend it that if you're interested in just like, how does a brand really elevate from a like like a niche brand and kind of do a transformation with some seriously vocal heroes for the brand? That PBR study and the Sriracha studies are really really interesting. That's great. It's great advice. Um, kind of clicking on to the whole social media part of what you were saying. The um, the social media being such an important role in in our everyday life. How um, is General Mills or anyone that, out in the market, how are they utilizing social media to connect with multicultural audiences? I think, um, so what we do you know, at Mills and what I would recommend and what I would do and what I've done in other companies as well, um, is that social media and the content creators that are on there are culture navigators. They are our invitation to the party. They are um, you know, the party host. Um, mm -hmm. in a way that the people sitting in the conference room don't represent. And so I think that, as I mentioned earlier, like social media influencers, the right content partners can open doors for brands in a way that a brand alone would not have been able to do 10 to 15 years ago. And mm -hmm. so I would highly recommend that if you are a brand that you are looking to engage with an audience that maybe you don't have a lot of um, intimacy or empathy for, work with individual content creators because they're part of your 
demographic. They are your consumer. And so use them as a focus group and use them as a, as a content generator um, and use them to help you to develop your, your creative strategy. I think my biggest thing is we have so many brands in the world who tell content creators what they want them to do. I think the dynamic could be really, really interesting and the content could be very different. And I've seen other brands do it and we've done it at Mills where we're actually in partnership with the content creators to be able to say, this is what we want to do. Here's our brief. Um, what's the creative strategy that you would approach? Like what is the in culture um, authentic approach that you would take to solve this? And that has been tremendous. And so you're essentially leveraging those content producers to almost be like a mini marketing team because they truly understand the consumer um, right. that you are trying to reach as long as you're identifying the right content and social influencers to partner with. Yeah, I mean, I personally think that social influencers are growing. I mean, I would love to see your opinion um, that social influencers, celebrities, musicians are being used more tactically, I think, than they have in the past. Um, and do you do you see that as a maybe you just spoke about this, but do you see that as a, a route um, that people can tap into? And for smaller for smaller companies that are trying to um, this is trying to kind of grow or put their foot or toe into this marketplace. Um, do you suggest them doing it on like a a, ge a geographical or geo-targeted way first to start, or do you have an opinion on that? It really, it depends on the business case, right? So I do believe in test and learns, especially if you're a smaller brand or you're just starting to dip your toes or, or get into the space. Um, what I will say that's been super powerful that we even look at is we are able to, with our vendor partners, take a look at geographical areas and even identify, you know, cultural culture or country of origin. Um, so if you looked at certain areas in Dallas, you have a greater number of South Americans than you do of someone who's Mexican descent, right? And so you'd have to sit there and say, okay, well, Modelo is very clear. Modelo is tied to the Mexican cultural affinity, whether you're right. fifth or eighth generation, whether you're, you know, a non-Latino who just really loves Mexican culture, Modelo is getting you there. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that is an opportunity when you really start to understand like what culture of origin you really want to tie into. So I know I'm preaching to the choir. If you're on this webinar, you want to learn about this and you probably have already, you know, delved into it, but there are very vast differences among us in our Latino diaspora. And so, you know, don't do a sports sponsorship with like Mexican national team if you want to reach, you know, Caribbean Latinos. So those are those little nuances. And so to, to BJ's mm -hmm. point, getting down to the geographical level, really understanding who that market is. I think, again, you if you're a consumer first brand, which you have to be to be successful, you do need to get that data and that information. I also don't think it's exclusive. I think it's part of your um, your inputs that really help you to create your program. When it comes to those content producers, as you were mentioning, BJ, I think there's just so many powerful voices. And there's also great vendor partners like HCODE and NGL who can really help you to navigate, to understand the insights, to understand the geography and understand what voices will help you to amplify in the best way possible so that it is authentic and organic um, for your brand. But I would also say what has been really interesting is the amount of celebrities that are launching their own brands. And so if you're a smaller brand, then I would just, I would say like, there's an opportunity there's a lot of celebrities that are seeing their counterparts um, really cashing in on, on these opportunities. I mean, when The Rock launched a tequila and I was like, okay, I'm done, right? Oh, right. The Rock has a tequila. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I haven't tried it yet, but we'll see. We'll see if it <laughs> um, but there's all those opportunities. So I just, I do think that there's such an interesting way. Um, and again, it, it, there's no one size fits all, unfortunately. It really depends on what the brand is, what the category is, and what you're trying to accomplish from a business standpoint. Yes, business growth, but like, where are you trying to go in the long term, and what are the short short term steps that are going to help you to get there? Right, right. So when you're looking at, I mean, there's a lot of new. Um, I'm not going to call it. Well, there's a lot of new and different. There's the TikToks of the world. There's Instagram. There's do you see any one particular um, Facebook, do you see any of those particular entities, if you will, um, being more persuasive for the for the Hispanic market or multicultural market? Or um, you don't want to? No, it's just, it's hard because it depends on who, right? It's, it's who within the Hispanic market and who within 
um, the multicultural market. I mean, I know TikTok has been hugely successful for a lot of our brands and for a lot of brands out in the ecosystem. Um, do I, as a bilingual, bicultural, you know, 40 plus Latina use TikTok? No. Um, yeah. So I can't say it's going to be great for everybody. Um, so I do think the platforms themselves can really help you as brand owners to identify what they can actually do for you, right? So Facebook is better for the older Latinos and then like Twitter is for this. So they're all very specific. Um, I also would not undersell the incredible power of working with a music, um, like digital music provider, because I do think that SoundCloud, Pandora, they do really great work. Um, and Spotify is a great partner. And so when you take a look at those opportunities and you put yourself into the right cultural expression, you can actually make really great impact. And the other thing is, I honestly believe, and I saw someone put in the chat about local insights and it's absolutely true, but I still believe in the power of out of home on a local you know, bus shelter. There's still tremendous power there. And so I, there, was a, there was an example, it was a case study from Canada and I think it was Coca-Cola and they had done these like a digital billboard in, in uh, Toronto and it was very specific to the area etc but my whole point is I think we are we have gotten so enamored with digital online that we forget about the like the potential of digital out of home and just even showing up in the in the places and spaces that matter physically to our consumers and so that mm -hmm. ties back to your local impact because again like I mean there's still a lot of power on having a cart card at a retailer depending on what right. you're trying to accomplish <laughs> I didn't think about that, but there is another question, and it actually is relevant to this conversation um, from Leonardo. Thank you. Um, how do you see social media like YouTube in connecting with Hispanics? I mean, YouTube's amazing. I think I went to a conference like 10 years ago where they were just like, YouTube is a network among, you know, people between the ages of seven and 15. Um, I am a cord cutter. I've been a cord cutter for the last 10 years. So focus group of one. YouTube is where I get my news and I get fed a lot of ads that I see on YouTube that I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Let me go check this out. And if you see it on your on your smart TV or you see it on your tablet, there's a little bit more interactivity. So when you start to think about like the future of connected commerce, right, where creative connects you down to conversion, um, I think YouTube is an incredibly powerful platform where you can get a lot of information, you can get a lot of data, you can buy it against the programmatic areas that you want it to show up in. Um, and it has that interactivity component, which I think is incredibly crucial because if you are not connecting your creative to conversion, I mean, your path is broken. Right, it's true. Um, okay, so not speaking specific, specifically of General Mills, but CPG in general, um, it's such a huge part of our world. And I have not seen a, a lot of huge, my opinion, and I do follow this, a lot of huge efforts, if you will, in the multicultural arena. D do you know, or do you have an opinion on, on why that is? And do you think that's going to shift? Um, to clarify your question, BJ, do you mean like- um, Large, like, like what? Like holistic efforts? Because I, I will call out PNG, right? So PNG is is best in class. Right. Um, and when you see what they've done with their films for the, the Black American community, when they've they've turned around and they've said, these are product lines specifically for this community, and we're going to make sure that yep. we have representation all the way down to R&D. I think PNG has been um, elevating the industry. I, I really think I that agree. they've raised the bar consistently for us all. Yep. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we get more of these companies to be like PNG? I think the number one challenge is always going to be resources um, yeah. and, and prioritization, right? So again, finite budgets, finite mental real estate. It really, it really depends on the company, depends on the brand. Um, mm -hmm. If you are for the under 18 population, then again, diversity natives, multicultural majority, that completely changes the game that you're playing in. Now, if you have a brand that is for, you know, um, aging adults. I don't like the words boomers because it puts a weird tone onto it. And the reality yeah. is, is like people over the age of 60 are dynamic and vibrant and amazing. And we have to like change the bias of that. Um, but then that's going to have a different approach and that's a different conversation. And, you know, that's still a majority white population. And so right. I really think it depends. Like I, you know, as a strategist, my natural habit I is I ask more questions. 
you know, then I have answers. Um, but I do think that there are things that we can start doing, which is to hold ourselves accountable. And I work a lot with AIM. Um, they're an incredible resource for anyone who needs it. So the Advertise uh, Association of National Advertisers um, Alliance for Inclusive and Multicultural Marketing. Um, one of the things that they've done, and the ANA had the See Her initiative, and they have it still. And they've published a lot of information about See Her in terms of like what questions you should be asking, benchmarks you should be putting. And I do think that we as uh, company leaders in, in a diverse nation really need to start holding ourselves accountable to who are our suppliers and who are the voices at the table um, from a diversity and inclusion standpoint and how are we reflecting the communities that we serve. And, uh, and you know, I, I do think that there should be some industry benchmarks that we could really hold ourselves accountable against um, that also serve as, as goals for us to, to really focus on and move forward to. So, um, you know, I'm thinking people who are new to marketing in the whole, in the multicultural world, what associations, what newsletters, what, what, where should they be getting involved and what should they be reading? Because I think that there's, there's unknown people who are just getting into this may not know like mm -hmm. aim or, you know, Hispanic pro or whatever. So totally. what are your yeah what what are you what's your list of favorites um, or so, most helpful now, i no, shouldn't no. say favorites that'll put you in a box <laughs> let's just say let's just say i have to be very careful about who i mentioned i know i see that careful look on your face so. <laughs> <laughs> i will just say that there are resources that i love and what i and i think what has been incredible is the adoption of these kinds of formats is um, I'm talking to you from Michigan. I, you know, bought a weird little cabin house near a lake in Michigan, and it was amazing. And that's, this is the conversation that we're able to have. And where historically, maybe we had that with like an audience of 40 people in a small conference room in New York. Um, this is a completely different platform. And I think it's been amazing. And I bring that up to say that there's a lot of incredible content. So Brand Innovators, I think has been an incredible partner. Um, I only learned about them probably in the last year, and it has filled my cup. There are um, these conversations through Run Innovators have been incredibly powerful. There's also the Hispanic Marketing Council, um, previously AHA, Cultural Marketing Committee, and our Cultural Marketing Council, and now the Hispanic Marketing Council. So they have webinars as well. They put out a fact pack that is really powerful. Um, AIM, as I mentioned, the a, a AIM, really phenomenal infographics resources. It is, in my opinion, I think, the true voice of the industry. Um, and just an incredible leader to making sure that we are we are picking up forward momentum to again future proof our business. Um, what else can I think of? Um, Hispanic ad, I sign up for that. I think I've been on their newsletter list for like two years, but I love it. Yeah. I love the Hispanic ad newsletter list. So if you want something super simple and digestible, that. Um, the other thing I will say is if you're new to the space and you're interested in Hispanic marketing, um, experience the culture. So it's not about a newsletter. Um, I will recommend Headified because I'm, I, I am a little bit cautious to be like, and you can watch about this culture, experience the culture, go and experience the food, talk to other people, be in the, be in the place. Um, you don't need permission and you don't need to be Latino to experience Latinidad. And so I will say, and I say this all the time at Mills, you can bank on the power of Latinidad to engage consumers in this country today and moving forward. And that is, that is my rallying cry to this community. Yeah. That is my rallying cry internally. There is power in Latinidad, but you need to make sure that you are in authentic relationship with the consumer and you are in authentic relationship of that culture. And you can't do it by just doing a Dia del Muerto spot. Please don't do that. Um, you can't do that by just doing a Hispanic um, heritage spot. You need to be a part of the culture and you need to experience the culture to be able to be a cultural navigator. And I will say that if any of you have diversity and allyship trainings in your company, take those and apply those same fundamentals to how you do consumer marketing, because a lot of those approaches are very relevant to how you actually output as a marketer. Fantastic. Well, there's Ashley, <laughs> or Emily. Sorry, Emily. No problem. Um, and we, have to, we have to sign, sign off, but Kimberly, you don't know how much I appreciate you. And I'm sorry for the black box in the corner. And I got dressed up. I put makeup on, I did everything. I, I look so either. good today. <laughs> So thank you. I'm sorry. Do this. We do this again. I'll make sure that I'm I'm here. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you all. It's so yeah. an honor. Really. I appreciate you all. Yeah, thank I you. wish we could hear from you for another hour, but we so appreciate you joining us today. That was such a great conversation, and um, hope to have you back again soon. Really appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you. Have a great rest of your afternoon.